Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to the American Sci-Fi Classics uh, at Dragon, um, the American Sci-Fi Classics track at DragonCon goes virtual. I'm distracted by the cat. <laughs> Are you kidding? I love it. Uh, but welcome in for a panel where there are a lot of smart people and me. I uh, uh, today <laughs> our topic is uh, making sci-fi add up math in genre, and to do all those things, I'm gonna introduce or allow these other people, these other kind and learned individuals, to introduce themselves. Starting one internet to my left, with you, sir, the man whose idea this was. Yeah, yeah. it's his fault. Hey. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> So my name is Darren Bush. I am allowed to say that I'm an award-winning science fiction and fantasy author. I'm also uh, helping out creating content and doing panels for a lot of local Atlanta science fiction and fantasy conventions. I am also, specific to this panel, I was a, uh, a math teacher working in a special ed firm for about a decade before I switched over to uh, fixing computers for a living. Big mistake. <laughs> but uh, I, have, I have actually been... A, I don't, for lack of a better term, a math teacher, although I was not a classroom teacher. I have a lot of respect for classroom teachers. I, I, I can't do it. But I did teach algebra and geometry and other things like that. Uh, so that's part of this discussion here. So I'll hand it over to the next person. And that is two internets to my left right there. Hey. Uh, my name is Michael Faulkner. I'm a writer and a podcaster right here in the Atlanta area. Uh, my blog is at Creative Criticality, uh, where I talk about Doctor Who and all sorts of things, pop culture, uh, relevant to this discussion. Uh, I am uh, very steeped in mathematics, both in my education background and my work uh, that I do, uh, both my previous career and the current one I'm in. Uh, I work as a, a nuclear safety engineer. I was in uh, a nuclear engineer in submarines with the United States Navy. And I got my bachelor's degree in physics. So I, there's math everywhere. <laughs> and one internet to the left, as internet directions go. There you go, ma'am. My name is uh, Deanna Tux Pierce. I am actually a grade seven and eight teacher here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And uh, one of the things I have the pleasure of teaching is math. Uh, my degrees aren't in math. But as the daughter of a microbiologist, I was never allowed to be bad at math and science. <laughs> uh, so um, when I got into teaching, uh, I ended up teaching a lot of math. And in fact, to the point that I'm known as mathy uh, amongst the, on the staffs I tend to work on. Uh, I'm also, as you can see, a sewer and I have a fabulous uh, fabric collection and I have some math fabric behind me as my backdrop tonight. So, yeah, math. Yay. <laughs> and uh, one internet below Miss Deanna, my co-director. Hi, everybody. I am Gary Mitchell. I am, the, as Joe said, the co-director of the American Sci-Fi Classics track. Uh, with Darren Bush, I work on other conventions in the Atlanta area as well. Uh, I play D&D with Michael Faulkner, so there was a lot of math there. Um, <laughs> and I'm mainly here, I think, for Deanna to make fun of my lack of math. <laughs> I don't make fun of people for their lack of math. Oh. I make fun of you for other reasons, Gary. Okay. <laughs> and uh, to the right of Gary, everybody welcome back. Uh, Mr. Sherman, how are you? I'm doing okay. My name is Sherman Burris. I am Good. I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm Sherman Burris. I'm from upstate South Carolina. I've been a fan of science and science fiction for pretty much all my life, and uh, this just gets into it uh, uh, pretty neatly. So I'll just, that's why I'm on this panel tonight. Okay. And uh, finally, but not leastly, <laughs> the owner of the cat who uh, <laughs> made a cameo appearance just a few minutes ago. There you go, ma'am. Oh, there she is again. This is Oswin. Hey. Oswin's going to yeah. go away. She'll probably be back. Um, <laughs> I'm Lucas mother. I of am course. a of podcaster course. and co-host of Women at Warp, a feminist Star Trek podcast on the Roddenberry Podcast Network and uh, pertinent to this panel. I have a degree in mathematics and my specialization, as you are, will find out, was in chaotic dynamic systems. 
Um, I haven't used it since I graduated. <laughs> and I am now an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> but I still love it. And um, that can be chaotic. In, in, in going back and researching a bit for this panel, discovered that one of my favorite professors' websites has not changed in 20 years. So that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of me really wants that yeah. I've seen the website but part of me really wanted it to be hosted on like Angel Fire or something like that like I just sure. really want it GeoCities so speaking of what we're not going to talk about I just wanted to clarify for our audience that there, there's been a lot of discussion about physics in science fiction and that's not what we're talking about tonight we're talking about math uh, if, uh, if if anybody gives, yeah, the right, the engineer is going, what? But I would love to find out from Joe and Gary that enough people like enjoyed this that we could do some physics discussion in, in a future date. I would love to do that too. I, I, I but, think the science track might come after us eventually. Probably. Uh, that's assuming that they're watching this, right? Which yeah, I would exactly. love it if they were, but. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they, they definitely have a lot of panels on the science track. There are also usually panels on track track for, mm -hmm. for all of the, the scientist uh, attending professionals, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could do a science one or a physics one here that just doesn't talk about Trek and talks about like American <laughs> sci-fi classics. Just, we can bring them on. I think we just got to make okay, sure. Okay, see, we that's a science away. track coming for us already. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is living in New York City. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> science police. <laughs> All right, Derek, this is your idea. Roll. Oh, I get to go. Thank you. I You're number that. one. The uh, be, you be the math. Prove one is zero. <laughs> that was a typo. That was a typo. Not twice. That was a typo. Uh, so, so really, what what started all this conversation is that Deanna and I, both being math educators uh, in our own various ways, were kind of just geeking out and talking about stuff. Oh, I found another one! Yay! And uh, I've always wanted to continue the conversations about how science fiction has the word science in it. So really screwing up the math is almost inexcusable for the, it's not like, it's not like it's urban fantasy and the algebra just doesn't matter. This is spaceships and, and laser swords and things like that. So doing a little bit of math homework uh, would improve some science fiction tremendously. Sometimes it is embarrassingly bad how much they miss. But I also do enjoy every once in a while when science fiction is a way to kind of trick people into learning something about math who wouldn't normally. One of my favorite comments I ever heard about Minecraft, uh, a game which you might have heard of, is that the author of Minecraft tricked 40,000, or excuse me, 40 million people into learning how to do CAD. I was like, that's a good point, that's a good point. So that's where we're at. So, so Deanna and I started talking about this, started making some notes, and then uh, suddenly the math nerds started jumping up going, ooh, me, 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 me. I had no idea how many, uh, how many degrees in math we had in in the classic track irregulars until just now, basically. So should I should I go ahead and start with an example? Let me let me just get this over with. I know that I'm not the only person who's going to refer to Jurassic Park tonight if if uh, things go the way I want them to. But really, the first thing I thought of when I thought about doing this panel was the fact that there's a moment in Jurassic Park in the book, not in the movie. I'm, I'm it was never going to make it in the movie. They were never going to pay money to have this scene in the movie. But in the book, there's this moment where uh, the characters in the book really do a fabulous job of completely screwing up the math. Um, it's not the author. The author's pointing out the the arrogance, the hubris of, of the scientists in Jurassic Park. And Ian Malcolm goes over and says, okay, so how many dinosaurs you got? And they told him exactly how many it was. It's like 632 or something like that. So how do you know? And they went, well, we, we breed them in such a way, we built them in such a way that they can't breed. And he goes, okay, all right, sure, whatever, but you count them, right? He goes, yeah, the computer counts them like every, anytime we want, every day, every hour, whatever it was. And he says, okay, do it right now. And they're like, okay, they push a button and 632 dinosaurs, and that's it. He says, okay, wait a minute, uh, how does that work exactly? So he gets them to explain how they put together the algorithm. Uh, don't forget to fill out your bingo cards tonight. He, he got them to explain the algorithm and he was like, wait, wait, hold on. So you told the computer that there's 632 dinosaurs and it stops counting when it hits that number. And they all went, yeah. And he went, turn that, do me a favor, turn that off. And they went, we don't need to, 
We don't need to turn that. They had an argument. And he got them to turn it off. And uh, the, the computer got up to, I think the computer found over a thousand dinosaurs on an island with 632 dinosaurs that can't breed. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, this is not a good example of, of an author getting the math wrong. This is a good example of how math can be, I think, a useful tool in, in telling a science fiction story that's compelling and exciting and has math in it too. So Deanna, what was, what was the first thing that you thought of when I, when we started talking about this? Well, one of the things that we see a lot of in math, uh, in science fiction is we see it used a lot as magic, um, where it's used to explain away something that possibly can't happen. And because there is a general lack of math literacy in the population, they really do use math as magic. So if you think about the show, The Librarians, with the character of Cassandra, and I love The Librarians, and I love Cassandra. I love that they made Mathy a girl. But the way in which she visualizes the math happening in, in the air and suddenly starts spouting off math theories that may or may not be related to each other. Um, and, you know, Euler comes up a lot when Cassandra talks about math. Um, and then suddenly she solves the problem. So math is very much used as magic in science fiction fantasy, if you think about it. And I think that also comes from just a lack of understanding of math in the writer's rooms. Mm -hmm. So a show that I think gets it right, and I'm going to dip into children's television here, um, is Phineas and Ferb. So if you're not familiar with Phineas and Ferb, which you should be, and if you're not, it's on D+, and if you've got D+, for The Mandalorian, maybe watch it. Um, it's about two brothers who spend their summer vacation every day building some kind of ridiculously fantastical invention, like a whole roller coaster that goes all over town. And then their older sister, Candace, is busy trying to get their mother, get them in trouble with their mother, and by the end of the episode, the fantastical invention disappears in some way. There's also another plot with a secret agent who's a platypus, who's their pet, um, and it's kind of awesome. But they dip into math a lot because Phineas and Ferber are represented as geeks and nerds and their friends are all geeks and nerds. Um, and so there's a wonderful episode where they're going through sort of some kind of maze and they have to solve problems or answer riddles to get to the next step. And so what they get to is that classic jelly bean, how many jelly beans in a jar question um, that you may remember from fun fairs or, you know, con you know, birthday parties, whatever. How many jelly beans are in this jar? And they have to get the exact right number to open the door. And so at which point Phineas Ferb and, Bel and Bar Baljeet, who's one of their friends, whip out their calculators and they start calculating. And their the discussion and why this is math related is around pi. So they start talking about pi and Phineas goes, well, that should be really easy. We'll just use uh, 22 over seven. And Gary, if you could show the slide that uh, I shared with you, we brought visuals guys there. There, there may indeed be a quiz later because teacher <laughs> story, um, but Phineas goes, we'll use 22 over seven. And Belgique goes, oh, that's interesting. Why aren't you using 3.14? This uh, the metric system. And Phineas says, well, but 22 over 7 works better with the fractions from inches than the, the 3.14. And Melchie goes, but I would just use metrics. So there's an interesting conversation there around pi, because what pi is the ratio between the circumference of a circle and its diameter. So how many times does the diameter go into the circumference? It's 3.14159. That was represented as 22 over 7 for years and years and years and years. But the problem is uh, 22 over 7 isn't actually 3.14159. It works out to be 3.14285, et cetera, et cetera. So that little like 10 second conversation opens up that whole conversation around measurement with the metric system versus imperial and how the 22 over seven works better with the inches and in the, 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 the five eighths say in, in the imperial system. But then 3.14 is more, the 3.14159 is more accurate for pi. So it's a gorgeous little mathematical conversation that happens in a children's television show. Uh, it's beautiful. And then, so um, I, you don't know if you if you've shown that slide yet, Gary, or not. Uh, I was waiting for you to send me the file. I sent it in the chat today. 
It's okay. We can skip. But I got it. Fine. I got it. Oh, okay. oh, Sue sent it to me. Yep. Right. Um, but uh, so yeah, no, it's it. The two are really kind of it's a beautiful little conversation about pie that opens up the value of pie. Now you could argue that Phineas the the and Ferb what they're trying to find out how many jelly beans in a jar. The accuracy of pie is really irrelevant because like we're not going to get into so there we got the two values of pi um that 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 two the, that if you use 22 over 7 it's going to give you an accurate enough number to get the exact number whereas 3.14159 may be more accurate but the the answer may at the end be the same so then there's even a conversation around how many decimal points of pi do we actually need does anybody remember how many decimal points of pi we actually need as All human beings, no, <laughs> no, because <laughs> this is the beautiful thing about pi. Pi is irrational. Pi never ends. So you could keep doing pi. You could keep figuring out pi, the next decimal place of pi forever, and it would never end. And that's a concept a lot of people have trouble with because math is seen as a very binary subject very yes, no, this is the right answer, or it's not the right answer. And so when you start getting into concepts like irrational numbers like pi, that blows children's minds. It blows a lot of adult minds too. In fact, I believe there is, is there not a US state that has said that for purposes of the US state, there's the like, pi mm -hmm. is valued at three, um, which blows, like things are going to fall down. Oh. <laughs> I mean, like, Apparently. Yeah. It apparently blows the minds of supercomputers yeah. as well, because this is something that happens in a Star Trek mm. episode, um, where it, which has always made me furious, <laughs> because uh, Spock stumps the computer by telling it to compute to the last digit the value of pi, and the computer literally but screams. In, but in agony. fact, it's like, pi it's is amazing. used as a way to test the 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 strength of your computer. So in computing, they have it calculate right. pi, and how fast it can calculate pi to a certain digit tells you how if the processor is working at the speed you want it to. And in fact, they're building supercomputers for the sole express purpose to calculate the next digit of pi. And you might think, but can't you just carry the one and keep going? That No, that's not how that works. It's, it is a phenomenally beautiful little, little number and it's gorgeous in what, and yet it is something mm -hmm. that the Greeks figured out on sand tables. Like the, like the Egyptians were playing with this too. Like they hadn't quite gotten it there yet, but they were playing with it like well, on sand tables. <laughs> yeah. And, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't we um, in the real world tried to use math as a way, if we're going to communicate with aliens, that would be the first step because if we can get them to understand, you know, like, cause pi and math is sort of a universal constant. Mm -hmm. So if we can go, this is pi, it gives us a place to start from. The, the yeah. thing about uh, the space aliens and, and math that's interesting, and this comes up a lot in science fiction. Um, and I, I definitely have this on my list of things that we might talk about now on this panel is that, and this is something that confuses a lot of people is math is not something that we've, created it's something that we've discovered mm -hmm. math is the language of how the universe is put together and how it works and so math is ca uh, capable of being the universal language that it doesn't matter how odd another sophisticated civilization is we should be able to we should be able to understand each other's math because math is just this thing that exists and that we um, all, all of these little symbols on the slide here all these little squibbles of, of electronics or ink if you're writing on paper. These are all things that we've invented so that we can communicate in the language of math, which is there. It's not something we invented, something mm -hmm. we've discovered. But in a, in a practical sense, when we're talking about irrational numbers, numbers like pi, we have, we've, we've come up with approximations like 22 over seven. We've come up mm -hmm. with, with where we can round off and be reasonably confident with our answer for whatever it is that we're doing. And our computers and our calculators are built to handle that. Mm -hmm. So if my like TI 89 from 2000 can handle Pi, then the enterprise computer should also be able to handle Pi. And so Gary, all can, I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. <laughs> Gary, you can exit out of that slideshow now. Um, so back to my my question about uh, Pi. Ooh, 
Uh, back to my you question. Don't leave pie. it forever. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah, no, you can like because uh, Sue Sue's got stuff on it too. So just so you know, Gary. We'll just um, when to pop back to it. Yeah, and if we have time, I can talk about Fermat, but I didn't want to monopolize the the whole thing. So we only need actually the, the scientists have decided, mathematicians have decided, we only as a species need ten digits of pi. That's it. We just need it to the tenth digit. Anything else after that is bragging. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, well, I I used to have mem I used to have contests with the kids where I would say like because memorization is not something we value anymore in education because computers can have the ability to memorize way more than we ever will and they can retrieve it far faster than we can. Um, so, but I would still have contests where I'd say to the kids, "How many digits of pi can you memorize?" And the kids would sit there and certain kids and would memorize like a hundred digits of pi and I'd be like, okay, have fun. Um, but it would, it's really kind of cool. Now <laughs> back to that seed in Phineas and Ferb, it's resolution is amazing. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it up because as Phineas and Ferb and the Baljeet are on their little calculators, Buford, who's the bully, he's the jock of the group, looks at them and goes, oh, give me a break. And he walks over to the jar of jelly beans, picks it up, slams it back like a shooter, basically swallows whole every jelly bean in the jar, puts it back down, walks over to the little keypad, types in zero, and the door opens. <laughs> So he cuts yeah. the Gordian knot. Well, cuts the Gordian knot. That's yeah. exactly yeah. it. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she goes, okay, that's fine, but you didn't show your work. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a lovely little 15-second moment, but it, it illustrates so much of math in those 15 seconds that it is mm -hmm. brilliant. And there's a lot more, like the Phineas and Ferb has a pie song at one point in a different episode where they have pies dancing going 3.14159, 3.14159. So Phineas and Ferb is, is really a show that somebody in the writer's room understands math and understands logic puzzles too, mm -hmm. right? So there's all sorts of, there's layers in that scene. So it's a show- Like a show, parfait. Like a parfait. Um, or a seven layer dip. <laughs> and, and so you can, you, it's really worth watching, especially if you like math, because you're going to be like, ah, right there. You're going to get it. You're going to get mm -hmm. that. All right. I want to, I want to hear an example, another good example from one of our other panelists, if anybody's ready to go. Man, I got a slide deck. <laughs> I know Stu's itching to, to do the slide. <laughs> All right. Which slide am I going to? Uh, you are going guess. to the slide. Just the, guess. Which one would you think she was going to start with? With Jeff Goldblum on it. Because <laughs> we're talking about Jurassic Park. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yay! Most, that, that's just here so we can look at it. Because it's, it's the best scene ever in a movie of all time. Um, but, I love so, that they made a Funko Pop of this moment. I have it. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'd like to go on record. I'd like to go on record as not supporting the objectification of chaos titians. <laughs> I'm to be on the record. So, um, if you can actually go to the next one, that's where where the description of chaos theory that we hear in the film Jurassic Park is. That it is. Oh, what just happened? Things are happening. There we um, go. That. Uh, deals with unpredictability in complex systems. The shorthand is the butterfly effect. The butterfly can flap its wings in peak canyons in Central Park you get rain instead of sunshine. Um, this is not a terrible definition. However, it is an incomplete definition of a chaotic system. Uh, this is only one of the, really the three aspects in the definition. If we can go to the next slide. This is the, the definition of a chaotic system as defined by Bob Devaney, rhymes with Fanny, say it wrong, you get an F, who was my professor in chaotic dynamics. And he literally said that in class every time he introduced himself at the beginning of a new year, um, where a, a system is chaotic if it has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And that is what people refer to as the butterfly effect, something small changing, having big ramifications. It also has to be topologically transitive and it has to, the, the periodic orbits form a dense scent. 
set. Those are things we're not necessarily going to go into today because I've got only a couple of minutes for four years of my life. <laughs> but I, I will just briefly mention the, the concept of topological transitivity is uh, basically that when you, you have different initial conditions, they don't stay close to each other is basically the what that is saying. Um, because sensitive dependence on initial conditions happens in a lot of systems. Merely doubling has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Two, four, eight, 16, three, six, 12, 24. So as you continue to iterate in the process of doubling, those the, the, the results are going to continue to grow farther apart. So that is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, but all of the results continue to grow in a positive direction and in, in the same, in, in a predictable fashion, I should say. So I also need to point out, because this definition is from 1989 and I need to do my due diligence, that it was later pointed out that sensitive dependence on initial conditions follows logically from the other two conditions of a chaotic system. So the definition is a little bit redundant, but since what people think of when they think of chaos theory is the butterfly effect or sensitive dependence on initial conditions, that's what I wanna focus on. Yeah. Next slide. Oh, that's everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I made these slides at midnight, you guys, it's fine. <laughs> But uh, we, we see this a lot in meteorology, and that is where, where even the example that Malcolm brings up in Jurassic Park is about the weather. Um, but because it's impossible as to, to model real world systems to such a degree that you can actually account for anything, everything, we, we have to work in proxi approximations in order to make our predictions. And because we're approximating a system that is already chaotic, and we are dealing with things like sensitive dependence on initial conditions, um, that's basically why your 10-day forecasts are useless. Anything more than two or three days out is really not going to be that accurate at all. It's magic. Anyway. I, I like the note there about the, uh, the rounding error. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I can tell that story. I just don't want to take up all the time. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, Edward Lorenz, who was a meteorology professor at MIT, was rerunning a program, a meteorology program. And um, when he did so, he found out he, he got a very different result than the first time he ran it. And it turns out that he, when, when the, the second time he ran the program, he did so with a value of 0. 0.506, when in fact the starting value was 0. 0.506127 is what it should have been. And that point zero 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 one two seven, which seemed insignificant, was the tiny variable change that led to very different results. And that was in uh, just nineteen sixty three. So this is a field that is, in terms of mathematics, at least this part of the field, is very very recent. You know, just the last less than a hundred years, eighty years or so, and um, really something that. Is has grown a lot because of our ability to work with supercomputers. But for examples, hopefully this is the next slide of some sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Yes, this is the Julia set. So the Julia set is, I, I put the, the uh, equation there, you don't really need to know it. But the point is that you are getting very, very different results depending on where you start in a relatively small plane. Uh, you're in the complex plane with xy coordinates between negative two and two. It's not very big, but depending on where you start, those are three in the in the images, three different examples of Julia sets with their their c value, as we call it, uh, really not that far apart. And if we go to the next slide, hopefully the GIF will work. Does everybody see yeah. it moving? Yep. Pretty. Cool. So mm -hmm. this is. As, as a variable in this equation moves from zero to two pi, this is how the Julia set changes. So just slightly along that line as it moves around. Now, Sue, you get, would you classify this as a fractal? Because Hollywood would. 
Yes, <laughs> this is a fractal um, because they are self-similar. And that is the, I mean, there are more defining characteristics, yeah. but that is one of the largest defining characteristics of a fractal. But yeah, I would absolutely consider Julia Set's fractals. Um, if we go one more time to another, the Mandelbrot set. Mandelbrot. Great song. A great song that actually describes a Julia set. The equation <laughs> that Jonathan Colton gives is for a Julia set, but that's okay because the Mandelbrot set, which is that heart-shaped box of strings and wires there in the middle that <laughs> is um, <laughs> essentially can be thought of as a map of Julia sets. So each point in the Mandelbrot set relates to a specific Julia set. It's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> but what, what's a really cool thing about the Mandelbrot set and, and its related Julia sets is that the Julia set looks similar to the point surrounding it on the Mandelbrot set, if that makes any sense. So if you were able to look up at the detail of where these these points are coming from. I'm pointing at my screen like you can see me. <laughs> <in the camp. laughs> um, <Okay>. But <laughs> right like here, the, kids. The the two um, the two lines that are basically coming out of the butt of the Mandelbrot set, you can see have that sort of rounded shape and are both almost like an, an eight in shape. And that's similar to what's happening in the Mandelbrot set there. The more squiggly ones are where more squiggly things are happening. The more antenna-like ones are where antennas are happening on the Mandelbrot set. So it's it's neat to see how they relate. And what what's being told to us by these numbers is whether a, whether a starting condition stays close, finds a what we call an orbit as, as something predictable, or it goes off in an unpredictable way. And those colors typically tell us how quickly a starting condition moves towards infinity based on the initial conditions we give we give the equation. Um, we will go one more slide. And I think this is my last one. This is the Mandelbrot set showing you how self-similar it is uh, as you zoom in on the little tiny bulb that is forward of the main bulb, you see another Mandelbrot set. And that is, uh, as Deanna brought up earlier, a feature of fractals. So oftentimes when we find ourselves uh, mapping or charting chaotic systems, they turn out to be fractals. So those are some mathematical concepts about chaos theory that I just breezed through, uh, well worth my four years and lots of money. <laughs> but. The thing is that uh, we can, I think we can stop the slides now before everybody gets dizzy looking <laughs> well, at the Mandelbrot suddenly set. suddenly wants to send you all our money because <laughs> that's the message that's been embedded in the fractal. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it's so correct. pretty. <laughs> it is so pretty. There's, um, there's a, a Twitter account that's, I think it's called Random Mandelbrot and it just sends out a zoomed in picture mm -hmm. every day. It's so great. But um, bringing it back in to, <laughs> to Jurassic Park, uh, the thing is that chaos theory has nothing to do with the sabotage at Jurassic Park, right? It has nothing to do with Nedry. It has nothing to do with, um, with, with the gates going down, but it does sort of have something to do with evolution, uh, with evolution. But it's being used more like a metaphor or a shorthand here for the unintended consequences, the unexpected outcome of mm -hmm. combining dinosaur DNA and frog DNA that was able to allow the evolution so that the dinosaurs could could procreate. This is, uh, I'm saying ridiculous sentences. <laughs> but the, the thing is, when you, come, when you come down to it with Jurassic Park, it's not really the chaos theory, right? That, that sends things haywire in Jurassic Park. It's the hubris. The same way they're, they're uh, shorthand in the book, mm -hmm. their, their bad algorithm sends yeah. it, it just proves that they, they don't think they can do anything wrong. So they don't account and check and put in measures to make sure that they haven't done anything wrong. And well, that's me talking randomly about chaos theory for however long I just spoke. 
<laughs> well, and, and that reminds me of a real world example, which anybody who's watched uh, the HBO miniseries Chernobyl, when Darren was talking about the whole counting the number of dinosaurs, the mat, they just, the computer stopped counting when it hit the predetermined number at Chernobyl, they didn't think that uh, it was really that bad because, well, it's only going up to this radiation level, but that's because that's where the reader stopped it egg there it could not read any further mm -hmm. um so it it's definitely hubris uh but i want to throw it darren that's uh, something that occurred to me as sue was talking about the fact that this is a very new branch of math uh that ties into what you said darren about m how math isn't something that we invented that we discovered do you want to go off on that a little bit well it's um that we we're have... still discovering mm -hmm. Oh, no, we're absolutely there's there's still some really amazing, amazing YouTube channels um, about how math is still fresh for the people that are really studying it and doing a lot of stuff with it. There's still tons of unanswered questions. Um, if the thing that I like that, can, that connects math to science fiction is that science fiction gives us a chance for somebody who's who's done their homework to take a mathematical concept and turn it into a really compelling story or to teach us the consequences of some of this mathematics, just like physics and chemistry and everything else, in a, in a, you know, on another planet, on a, on a spaceship, where we're emotionally separated from the politics and the consequences, but we can still learn the story. Um, there is a, um, uh, I think, I don't think we're gonna have time to get into any detail, but one of my favorite The Math is Correct movies of all time is Carl Sagan's Contact. And if you have, any doubt that Carl Sagan can get the math right, you haven't been paying attention. Um, it, it is a beautiful story about how math is useful to the universe and how we can use math to join the larger galactic conversation, if you will. So yeah, the um, I think the, the, the real world applications of, of talking about what the future holds for math is still happening, it's still real. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question, Gary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do we have? Oh, well, sorry. I was Go gonna ahead. say either Sherman or Michael. Do do one of you want to throw out a math genre story that sticks out for you? Yeah, I'll I'll go with it. Um, one thing that you know, with my previous previous life as a submariner in the Navy, I thought about with science fiction was the concept of navigation. Um, and it, it varies from property to property, obviously. But like Star Wars is really point and shoot. They have a, a nav computer that takes care of everything for them, you know. And, and they they go bouncing through hyperspace, but not like dusting crops. Uh, <laughs> and if they make a miscalculation, they could end up inside a star or something like that. But really, they leave it all to the, the computer to do. There's there's very few navigational um, terms that get thrown around in, in Star Wars. Star Trek, on the other hand, really snuck it in there. To, to help people understand what was going on and really introduce them to the geometry and the trigonometry that's involved in traveling from place to place. You know, when you think about, you know, if you're gonna go in the car and go for a, a trip to the store, you think about where you are at the beginning, where you are going to end up and how you're gonna get there with, with your course and your speed, and what direction you're going and how fast you're going there. Um, in Star Trek, they do things on on a, a plane, if you, if you think of this, this Blu-ray as, you know, your, your flat plane your ship is sitting on, you need a, a, a heading, which is going to be that one. And then if you flip it this way, you also think about your, your up and down, your, your attitude. All right. They, and they talked about it in, in terms of, well, I got this bearing mark and then an altitude, and then they just set a, a speed and away they go. And as we all know, Star Trek and Star Wars both, both travel at the speed of plot. Um, it took them five minutes to get from Tatooine to Alderaan. Uh, you know, anything like that, you know, oh, warp nine. Okay. We're there in two days or we're there in five minutes. You pick it, you pick a number. Uh, yeah. the one that I, that I really liked though, was Battlestar Galactica, the, the newer version of it, because Kevin Grazier, who was the science, the science advisor on that show really kind of took it to the next level where he, he looked at the, how we do things in, in, on earth in, in the, uh, in the way we talk about stellar dynamics, you know, just like I showed with with the, the Blu-ray prop there, but then he kind of translated into their own system, and we we kind of gone back and forth on talking about fictional units. Well, he he built that so that they actually throw you, you know, number 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 carom number number number, and then another set of coordinates for for distance, and that's that's all the same stuff I've just been talking about with the sphere that that you're you're sitting in, and they actually went a step further instead of saying, well, we could just set the warp drive and go forever. They said our FTL drives have what we call a red line. 
That is the maximum safe distance we can travel. We can go beyond it as they did in the first episode, but we, we have set a bubble that we can travel within. And that was actually very mind blowing as well to, to think about that. So, you know, when they, when they built this system, they also built it un unknowing where they were going with it, with the idea that they needed 12 numbers to get there, an X and a Y and a Z for distance. Well, then you get to the final episode and I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about spoilers because we're now what 17 years beyond the, <laughs> the end of the series. Um, they, they linked the song that was very important to the show into that, which also had a 12 note set in it. And by, by, you know, a little bit of, of, Hey, look at this coincidence. They're able to, to make it. So the final coordinates to earth are what this song was. that was driving them this entire time. Uh, the one caveat I'll look at for Star Trek though, is that even though they're talking, it's earth science, and they keep talking about, you know, circles. Well, how many times have you heard Captain Kirk order up a, a, a course that's greater than three, three, five, nine, right? He'll uh, set course three, seven, two. That doesn't work, Captain. <laughs> uh, it also works in, we had talked about targeting solutions too. This is where sci-fi has been really good about, about traveling and, and, be, and, and, you know, going from place to place, but targeting solutions, they kind of get a little waffly on. Um, that's just kind of magic. And, you know, it's because previous previous life as a submariner, you know, you need to have a target's range, bearing, course and speed. Bearing being from where you are in the center to where you're looking out on a on a compass rose. That's where that person is. So you need to know how far to shoot your 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 bullet or, or your torpedo, you know, where they are really in relation to you and then where they're going. And in submarines, it takes a lot more work to, to do that because you get one bearing shot on it and then you've got to get another one to figure all that information out. And usually it involves a whole bunch of course changes and everything else. Well, the Enterprise never really changes course when they're when they're getting ready to shoot on somebody. It's just, yeah, we got to figure it out. Okay, fire torpedoes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all magic. Work. You know, it's all magic. It's interesting that you bring up the Z coordinates because that's something that if you watch Star Trek, when they would do the space battles, it was very X, Y. It was very, and then yeah. that's wh what blew my mind in the final episode, All Good Things of Next Generation, is when Riker comes in and blows and he comes up the Z plane. And mm -hmm. it was just like, I remember screaming when I saw that because finally, we're using space like technically these ships should be <laughs> upside down and going mm -hmm. at each other yep. but they yeah. were always right side up coming at each they other they always like this. meet on yeah. the yeah. same plane and so it's just like that's not how space works <laughs> right like, space well it's is truly three-dimensional there's no gravity <laughs> like or min minuscule like there is gravity please don't write your letters but like you're duly you can actually move <laughs> in much different ways than you can in the atmosphere yeah. of earth or in the water mm -hmm. right yeah. or on land so yeah, yeah. I yeah, love that you brought of, that up. Yeah, I was, and I was going to say that one of the 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 great climactic moment at the end of Wrath of Khan yeah. is the whole he, it's his it's his he, he shows two dimensional thinking, mm -hmm. and they drop yeah. down, and then you get that great moment of the tension, yeah. and then the Enterprise just rising up behind. You're just like ah, and, and, and a lot of that was yeah. because the Wrath of Khan was built as a, as a submarine <laughs> movie. Yeah. Right? They, they, yeah. they wrote it just like that as, as a submarine thriller and they could do that. And it was mind blowing to me too. Cause you know, having, having seen all those, you know, okay, we're just traveling this way on a two dimensional plane. And it's like, wait, ships can do that. They can drop. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they can. And, and gotta... we, I would go to Sherman in a sec, but I just also want to mention, interestingly enough, a movie that you would not think would get math right. Fast and the Furious 6 got that right because <laughs> uh, Brian's character, when they're trying to stop the plane by shooting the, the the wings, the flaps, everybody's missing. And Brian goes, oh, yeah, I got to shoot in front of where it's supposed mm. to be. And he's then able to stop the plane with, yeah, car and the grappling hook. But that's another issue. But it's just it was fascinating. <laughs> the Fast and the Furious, he brought that up. And I thought, oh, my God, Fast and the Furious 6. <laughs> A movie that is not known for its love of any kind of physical science, math, anything, <laughs> got it right. Oh my god! All right, we, we got to we got to hear from Sherman yeah, we before we hear from Sherman. Time here. Sherman, uh, you have a yes, good uh, the examples that I've, I've found, and I've okay, uh, the couple of examples that I have are Star Trek, uh, specifically because 
they would they would use uh, quadrant and sector interchangeably. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. they, well, they, they did it in the original series and they did it in the next generation up until they started developing Deep Space Nine because they had to have a better understanding of different quadrants of the galaxy if you're going to have a space station that's in the Alpha Quadrant that goes to the Gamma Quadrant. And of course with Voyager and the Delta Quadrant. Um, the other example that I found that is really terrible is that uh, the uh, Transformers don't uh, do <laughs> logistics very well. They have they have a, have the set set on an Earth that has at least two suns because, especially specifically in the Bayformers movies, um, everything happened in daylight, no matter where they were on the on the surface of the planet. Uh, when they were bringing about their world destroyers, suddenly. They were in North America, then they were in Southeast Asia, and it, the sun was still shining, and it was all, all in the same day. So they they, they, they were uh, a little off on that. <laughs> it's time zones, Sherman. Time zones. Come on. <laughs> they just moved with the sun. Right. Timey wimey wibbly. Well, oh, wait, wrong track. Jeremy yeah. <laughs> Bear me. <laughs> there's, a, there, there's, a, there's an Edgar Allan Poe short story like the Edgar Allan Poe, where he exploits the international dateline mm -hmm. for a punchline. It's a great story. It's a great little story. Yeah. yeah I, um, <laughs> I think also the other main math-based sci-fi story everybody loves to throw around that we haven't talked about yet, which is interesting, is the cold equations, which is a kind of a problem story these days. Uh, but anyone who doesn't know it, it's basically a person stows away in a spaceship and has to be jettisoned because of the math is they only have so much fuel and she brings the ship overweight and there's no way to fix it because math is math is math. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of people use that as a political allegory as well, which that's a whole other panel. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you guys think about the fact that, you know, is the math, the math is the math. There's a, there's, there's real stories from a couple hundred years ago where sailing vessels would literally come within a few meters, yards, of a safe cove and miss and go right back out into the ocean. Uh, the, the reality is, is that navigation uh, doesn't care about your feelings. Uh, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if you calculate incorrectly, you miss. And if you're lucky, you get to come around all the way around again and try again. But the reality is that any any science fiction story where the spaceships come really close and miss, or you you know the, the two characters' hands are this close and then suddenly Mars sucks one of them in with gravity, the those the, that is part of the reality even on the surface of this planet. And it is a great element of storytelling if you can have the math be. Um, the bad guy, essentially, not not the math itself, but gravity or fuel equations or things like that. There's a way to make a compelling emotional story where the science and the math are correct, and you know, missing a couple of decimal places off of a calculation is is life and death. Mm -hmm. You can do that and still get the math right. There's, there's also the intersection of, of the mathematics, the science, and the engineering, too. And I, I know we weren't going to talk engineering here, but it kind of fits in. Um, because, like, these ones where, well, we don't have enough mat or enough, enough fuel because an extra, you know, couple of kilos is, is stored on board. Well, the engineers should have actually had a good safety margin built into that as well. So they had more fuel just in case something like this came up. Uh, another one is, you know, you, you see these shows like, you know, well, the movies like Star Wars or any of the other sci-fi type shows where they're in, in ships and they're always burning the engines you know to, to go somewhere if they're cruising well it's like why are you still burning fuel you know all you really need is a a burst of, of force to get you moving there is no resistance in space you could shut down the engines or put them at low power and it's conserve fuel mm -hmm. and then they come back with the the plot point of well we're, all, we're almost out of fuel like well how much how many gallons of fuel did you burn <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. you know, keep it keeping the pedal pushed down you want to believe that they're especially when we're talking about entertainment stories, right? That there's going to be a human element, that there's going to be some way to, you know, reduce the weight elsewhere. Like, oh, we, we don't really need our weighted blankets, you know, something that they can throw out an airlock to, to mm -hmm. keep someone else around. But I mean, that's not always the case. And I think if it were always the case, we'd get 
really bored with those stories mm -hmm. because there would be no real peril. Um, but I was also thinking as going through these, a, a show I remember having a lot of math in it that I was impressed with at the time, but have not watched since it was on the air was Stargate Universe. And there was, I remember there being a real peril to that as well. And that like, if they didn't get it absolutely right, then mm -hmm. they were all done for. Um, like I said, it's been many, many years since I watched it. So take that with a grain of salt. But I remember being impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of getting the math right, Joe, how much time have we got left? Uh, a couple minutes. A couple minutes. Can I talk I, I want... to what Barry said about about the math being the villain? I don't know if that would be what I would say. I would say it goes back to hubris. It would go back to humans thinking that they have thought about any combination and permutation of what can happen. They've planned mm -hmm. for everything. And it's that God complex that humans tend to have. And tying back into what Sue said about chaos theory, there the part about the universe we forget is the universe is very random and you cannot plan for everything. And I'm a planner. I'm one of those people that in order for my life to function and for me to be safe, I have to have a structure, but you can't plan for everything. So I don't think it's the math, the numbers that are the villain. I think in fact, in those stories, it's really us that are the villain because mm -hmm. we like Icarus flew too close to the sun and have now crashed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like uh, Sheriff Carter in Eureka mm. is constantly ending the show by going, all right, you guys are brilliant, but you missed something practical and obvious. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to go in there and punch something and save it. <laughs> you're, 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 you know, and I love, the, I love the show. I love the show, but he's kind of the anti-Wesley of Eureka, mm. right? It's, it's he's just... It's worth pointing out, though, too, uh, that when we talk about randomness, mathematically speaking, randomness is not the same thing as chaos. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very different concepts. And mm -hmm. yep. one can be predicted, whereas another cannot. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It's really interesting reading mm -hmm. if you're in the IT field to ask uh, to ask Google if computers are random. Because the answer not. is no, they're not. No, no they can't be. No, nope. they can't be. Because the algorithm is not random. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my husband's a computer programmer, and this is a long conversation we've had repeatedly about how mm -hmm. unrandom that random number generator is. So your your D20 is a better random number generator than the computer. Right. So so what Kirk should have done in order to mess up the, the, the bad guy computer was ask it uh, to generate a random number. <laughs> and then I can then I can see it screaming, going no. Oh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's a wonderful cheesy horror movie from the late '90s called Deep Rising, which one of the lines that's always struck with me because they were having to figure out fuel for a ship, and there's like one of the characters screams, "You mean we're all gonna die because you screwed up on the math?" <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, uh... I, I one time, one time, I ruined a game of of Cthulhu uh, because I knew what a Saturn square was and I knew how to solve them. And so the the game master was like, "There's this piece of stone with these sixteen numbers on it." And I went, "Here's the answer. Open that door." And he was like, "I hate you. I hate you." Cow. <laughs> I ruined a, a team building exercise at school because they brought us to this outdoor education thing, and they had the towers of uh, basically a, a huge version of Towers of Hanoi running. I'm like, "Oh, it's the Towers of Hanoi. Okay, that moves. That moves. That moves. That moves." <laughs> we were done in like ten seconds. It was really bad. The facilitator's like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> Math ruining fun for ages. <laughs> if if we have yes. a minute or two left, I'd love to just circle back to something Deanna said at the very, very beginning, where math is treated like magic in a lot mm -hmm. of our storytelling. And I think that that all circles back to at least I'll say in the US how how math is taught and discussed. And that only it seems that you know, it, oh, you like math? That's so unusual. You must be incredibly smart. There's this idea that that math is not for everyone. Yeah. 
And we need to change that because we math do. is for everybody. And it's just, it's in the way you're taught, I think, and in the way that, that you learn, because math can be taught in so many different ways. And I mean, for me, it's always been like pieces of a puzzle coming together when a yes. new mathematical concept yes. clicks, right? And mm -hmm. it's it's exciting, but there are so many people I know who are just like, I, I can't get past adding. And I, I think there's just this, this idea that math has to be a slog and it has to be difficult and it has to be hard for everybody to do and that it's so rare to find somebody who likes it. And we need to change that because mathematical literacy is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can tell you as a teacher who's taught now for 20 years, every year at parent teacher interview, I get a kid, I get a parent who comes in and sits down and says to me, Oh, he's like me. I don't understand math. I have never, ever in 20 years had a parent come in and go, oh, she's like me. I don't understand reading. I uh, Never. So it has to do with how we teach it and how it was traditionally taught mm. to most people out there. It also has to do with how our culture has then, because of that, treated math as this sort of rarefied science or knowledge that only a few initiate, initiates actually have access to. When in reality, as uh, Charlie said on numbers every single episode, we all use math every day. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that the financial crash that we had a few years ago came from the fact that people didn't understand basic math, that you can't keep lending money. At some point, it's got to come due. Mm -hmm right? Like you can't keep building up a, a debit. So yeah, that's financial literacy, but that's math. And so yeah. absolutely. And part of the problem is because math was so challenging for so many people in school, there is a fear factor in math that is insane. Yep. And if you change, speaking as a teacher who teaches math in a very different way than when I was taught math, once you start changing how it's taught, all of a sudden people are like, what? That's not how you do math because it doesn't look like the rote system that they memorized when they were in grade four or five, whatever, or whenever they were finally allowed. Cause I, you know, different jurisdictions allow you to stop taking math at certain times in Ontario, you can stop in, after grade 11. So you can stop at 17 uh, sorry, 16, 16, 17, you can stop taking math. You don't have to take it in grade 12, which is your last year. Um, in other jurisdictions, you know, you can stop 9, 10. Uh, like, so in that sort of uh, freshman, sophomore year, you can stop taking math at that point. So yeah, absolutely. We have to change the culture around math because then it, math is like so much become political. Like there are mommy bloggers out there who make their living going, look what they were teaching my kid. And they're like ranting. And you can tell they don't understand the math that they think has been taught wrong to their kid to start yeah. off with. Mm -hmm. But because it doesn't look like what they remember from junior high school, it must be wrong. So yet you're absolutely right, Sue. There, the, This yeah. is a big area. And in some ways, entertainment has to carry some of that bucket because look at how mathematicians are represented in television. Right, um, right. Very few of them are Peter Dinklage, who is in a strip club with hookers, uh, <laughs> you know, drinking like single malt whiskey and threshold. Um, very few of them are represented in that level of cool um, mo or Jeff Goldblum, you know, cool. Most of them are the Charlie Epps yeah. are well, the, you know pushing yeah. the glasses the up the nose and the first time I remember being taught a process so that if once you understand this process it will help you with the rest of this class right was probably calculus one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense because you're repeating processes the entire time you're in math yeah. and I, I'm not going to go into examples we don't have the time but that's what common core is doing so <laughs> like 30 seconds in defense of common core it might look more complicated when you're dealing with just whole numbers, but when you're, you're teaching a process so that when you get to fractions, so that when you get to variables, so that when you get to exponents, it's easier because you already understand the process and how the parts mm -hmm. of the equation work together. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to take away the memorization and understand 
how it works together. Yeah, and, that, yeah. and that's the thing is our math, mathematical systems are cultural. And that's something people don't understand is that algorithms are cultural. And if you don't believe me, look up Elizabethan multiplication or Japanese division. They look Japanese very, division's amazing. It's the easiest thing to do. <laughs> it is like, why didn't we teach it this way? But the, but the algorithms we have were invented in the industrial revolution so that P clerks in counting houses could do long columns of numbers quickly. So they're very efficient. They're super efficient. But there's all sorts of little hidden little tricks that when you're teaching them to people, people miss. And this is where people go, I don't understand math because they don't understand that you're not carrying the one, you're carrying a 10. Yeah. And, and we have these little shortcuts, right? And so alternate algorithms, reality is being able to do math fast has absolutely no value today because this this thing this thing i'm going to say the cliche has more computing power in it than what we sent people to the moon with okay I this can do math yeah. 10 times fat like a million times faster yeah, than my so i have to i have to bring this as back a, to science fiction i was gonna say just as a kid i remember in you know in the as a child in school in the 80s you will not have a calculator with you all the time. You yes, need you to will. learn this. Yes, yeah, you will. Will. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I have to I have to bring this back to science fiction. I I being a, a, a math tutor in a private firm, I was paid for results, not to follow a curriculum. So um, there are four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and there are four basic math functions. If you don't think that my math was color coded and ninja turtle coded, you you haven't met me. <laughs> yeah, I so, love good. It. so back to the fact you're right bethany we have to sorry sue bethany, bethany. it brain. happens a lot believe it or sue. not uh, <laughs> i'm an idiot um but i like math sue you're absolutely right we've got to change the culture around math because that's how we get more kids feeling better about math and more kids then go into STEM and we need people in STEM badly. And we need STEM to be as diverse as the human experience because different people see problems differently. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of problems facing us as a society and a diverse team. The research shows us the soon as you diversify your team, suddenly you get different solutions to problems that sometimes are better way better and faster and more efficient and cheaper and all that stuff. So absolutely. It's one of my, like as a math teacher, this is something I end up spending a lot of my time defending is I get, and believe it or not, interestingly enough, it is the, it is the parents who are more math successful, who are the ones who are more likely to challenge me on math. So they're the ones who maybe went into chemistry um, or went into physics. And because they don't have that math understanding, what they have is the rote power they're the ones who are more likely to challenge me on how I teach my math. It's interesting. It's very interesting. It's not, as you would think, people who weren't successful in math themselves. Those people are willing to trust me. It's the people who who's I know what I'm math. doing. Yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't we look need... like what I know because because it makes them feel dumb. And so anytime more... somebody feels dumb, you get a challenging, aggressive behavior out of people. Like yep. uh, th like nine times out of 10, when a kid is coming at me aggressive, it's because they feel like an idiot. So it's better to be the bad kid than to be the dumb kid. And that's also true of people. So we that's need fair. more good, we need more positive mathematical role models in science yep, fiction. Absolutely. Yeah. Solved. Us. Well, done, yeah. Joe, you were gonna say, yeah. I was gonna say, uh, speaking of Aggressive. <laughs> Maybe we need. To... <laughs> I was so. I I am not the best, clearly, at telling people to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not this group. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> yeah. No. I, no. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell. Uh, no, I'm gonna leave my bear. Leave it all in. I'm leaving it all in. I'm, I'm leaving so, it all in. Wait, wait, we're using American time? <laughs> no, it's metric time. <laughs> oh, metric time. Okay. Okay. oh, God, we've lost Gary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there is a metric Why, people? It's so easy. You divide by 10. Basically, yeah, that's why. it's too easy. We can't have that. Nope. <laughs> But I don't thank understand you. your temperatures. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's go around the horn and 
reveal your social media things, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, so I'm still Darren Bush. You can find yeah. my uh, short stories on the uh, on the Kindle on my Amazon authors page. You can also see me in per and well in person at uh, Dragon Con, Monsterama, Conjuration, and then conventions next year. Uh, I'm still Michael Faulkner. I still write for Creative Criticality. You can find me uh, with all of my my pop culture thinkings and and dribblings and drabbings and my Doctor Who thing because I do a lot of Doctor Who work uh, at CreativeCriticality.net. And I'm Deanna Toxpius. I have a Twitter account, but it's mostly about teaching. So you may not like unless you really want to follow me for you know how to do math. Um, well, and, like we were just talking about. You know, like well, for an hour you know, and five minutes, math. Deanna. Yeah. <laughs> People will follow <laughs> me. Um, but if you really want to see what I do, I run the Revolution SF Facebook page. So all those memes are what I hunt down on the internet and share with you. And uh, uh, or Gary, I don't care. Um, I'm Sue. You can find me on the tweets at Spaltor. That's S P A L T O R. Or uh, my podcast is at Women at Warp on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagrams. I am Gary Mitchell. You can find me on the Twitters here, and you can also find me on the Classics track, where you were already presumably are. Um, <laughs> Hopefully. And so, yeah. Unless it is Monday morning. So. Unless you made a navigational error. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Mr. Sherman. I'm, I'm Sherman Burris. I'm Sherman Burris. I can be found on social media under Nerdburger358 on Instagram. Discord, Pinterest, and Twitter. Thank you guys very, very much. Enjoy the rest of your Dragon Con Goes Virtual. If it is 3 a.m. when you're watching this, just like real Dragon Con, it's time to eat something. <laughs> Boom. And have a nice glass of pie. Yeah. Uh, something. Uh, <laughs> something. At 3 a.m. And and really, I, I got to say, going to a math panel at 2 a.m. at Dragon Con, that sounds like something we would all do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, might be sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you guys very, very much. We will see you very soon. <laughs>